Welcome to the Nanak Highlands Basketry Museum again. This is our second virtual exhibition for the year 2020, and this time we're doing a basketry story exhibition of five baskets that I've collected on my travels, and I hope you enjoy them. So we'll go upstairs to the loft in a minute, and we'll take you to the exhibition. Well, the first story goes back to 19. 75, when I was a third year student at Sheridan School of Design, and we had a project to do a photo essay. I had just become very interested in baskets, as I'd made my first basket for years in the 3D sculptural um, project. And so I arranged myself to go up to the Southampton Ojibwe Reserve and interview Mrs. Eugene Kugi, who made baskets. Now, on one May morning, off I went with my daughter Pippa, who I think was in grade 11. We drove up on a beautiful May morning to meet Mrs. Irene Kugi, who was in her house. When we arrived, the house smelled wonderful, just full of sweet grass. And this was all new to me. I had never done this before. And she had two beautiful baskets to show us, this one and this one. I thought I was going to see her making the baskets, but she had already made them and she was telling us about them. Now, in my photo essay, I took some pictures, which I, got. I actually found these pictures from all those many years ago, and she showed us how she made them. Now, I was very interested in sweetgrass, and of course, with this basket, you can see she has woven it all with braided sweetgrass, all this part and all this part is woven with a three-strand braid of sweet grass, which is incredible. That's just grass. And of course, sweet grass looks like this when you pull it up, just a long piece of grass. So you can imagine she must have spent hours making her braid, which is completely even. And this would have smelt beautiful at that time of the year. It just is marvelous in May and June. So this was an introduction to sweetgrass, which grew on the reserve. And then the other material she used was the split black ash, which she did, I didn't see her doing it. She was doing it outside in her garden. And the black ash also grow in that area. So the wonderful thing was she was just collecting her basket, using her skills and her tradition and making these lovely baskets. Now, you might wonder why they are a magenta colour. Well, she, I think, painted them afterwards. She painted them with some sort of magenta material. And of course, it's, they're 45 years old now. They have, uh, they have, but they must have been painted because the white of the split, split, the split ash is still inside. So these are my, my first two baskets, but I just think they are so beautifully, beautifully made decorated, very simple, and marvelous examples of the sprint wood basketry and combining it with the sweet grass. Whoops, I've got something inside it. I have a piece of sweet grass here to show you if you're interested. And if you would like to gather sweet grass and grow it in your garden, you can buy plants from Richter's Herb Shop, which is just north of Toronto and it's called Richter's, and they sell sweet grass. So there you are, you could buy some sweet grass plants and make your own baskets. Now the second basket in this exhibition is one that I found on my travels to Halifax. I have a very good friend in Halifax called Jolene Gordon, who has been involved in basketry there for years, and I went to see her and in the market stall in Halifax, they sell the most beautiful baskets of which this came, and they're made of split red maple. Now, it's a very interesting story. The origin of this basket was when the black community came up to Halifax in the early 1800s, and they settled just outside Halifax as a black community. Now, they grew gardens and took things to market and they needed a basket. In, in their original homeland, 
they had made baskets like this. And I'm not sure what the material was there, but they couldn't find anything in their new land to make baskets. So necessity is the mother of invention. They went out and looked in the swamp wetlands and found the red maples. And they discovered that they could cut the saplings of the red maples about 10 feet high or so, cut them down and they could split the red maple and make the splints, for, for make the um, handles and the ribs and the rim and also they could split it very fine and make the splints to weave the basket. Now this was an amazing discovery and of course they need market baskets to take their things to the market and as they progressed they started selling, making baskets and selling them in the market. And that is a tradition that is still being carried on today. Mrs. Edith Clayton was the original, I think, perhaps in the basket maker, I'm not sure. It was her grandmother who came and taught the first classes and started to do the basketry. And so her granddaughter was Edith Clayton. And Edith Clayton has been wonderful. She's taught people to make baskets and this is a whole book written about her and her basketry techniques. And now her daughter, who is called Clara Golf, is carrying it on and they're still learning and I think it's gone down to the great-great-granddaughter. The family still make baskets in Nova Scotia. They still sell them at the Museum of Halifax. And it's a wonderful story because they came and they found the material and I think they're the only people in Canada who use red maple. That was something they found because they had to find something to make their baskets. There is now another book written by Jolene, and this is on the, in, you can buy this on as a PDF from the Museum of Nova Scotia under publications. And this is a more complete book, and it also talks about the different types of baskets that they make using the red maple. So this is really a wonderful story, and I think it's just marvelous to think that this tradition has gone on since the 1800s, and it's still being carried on in the market today. And we can still go and buy them in the market. So I think it's just a, an amazing story for the basket world. Now the third exhibit is a beautiful basket made of white willow. And the story of this basket is that during the 80s, I was invited to go up to Sault Ste. Marie and teach a workshop at a basketry conference. At my, co at my workshop, there was somebody from Sault Ste. Marie who asked me if I knew there was a basket maker in the Sioux who sold white, white willow baskets to the community. Of course, I was thrilled. I said, no, I had no idea. I would love to meet them. So at lunchtime in the workshop, she made a phone call and drove me over to this house in Sault Ste. Marie. Now, unfortunately, the basket maker was having a snooze. He was a retired Italian immigrant, and I think he was well into his 90s. And when he retired, he had learnt the skill of basketry in, in Italy, and he had noticed that there were many willows growing along the bank of the river. So he knew how to gather and how to collect he went out in the spring and collected the willows. Now for white willow, you have to peel the willow when it's freshly picked, otherwise it, the, the part that has the bark on it. So he would have taken the willow, brought it home, peeled it, and put it ready to make the basket. Now this basket is beautifully made. As you can see, it starts here at the base. How evenly chosen the willows are. They are all the same size wove out to the bottom and then up they came up the side and then they came round and they went back down. So the willows came across the bottom, up the sides, down on the sides again and they formed the base at the bottom. And here they are now at the bottom. They're woven round the bottom and the ends are very neatly tucked inside. So it's the most incredibly beautifully made basket very difficult to make and beautifully done because all the willows are the same size. So they've been chosen and beautifully peeled. And I was very, very thrilled to be able to buy this beautiful basket, which is a traditional Italian basket style, 
used in the bake shops in Italy. Now I thought you might be interested to know how the white willow comes, because of course you can't grow white willow. White willow is when you go out in the spring and you pick pieces of willow that look like this. They're the first, they're the, they're the first shoots of the spring and they have leaves on them. And so you would collect a whole lot and you would take off the leaves like this and you would just have a willow. But then you would get your knife and you would take the bark off, which is a very easy thing to do. But of course, it won't do it now because it's, well, it does sort of, but you usually do this in the spring. And you can see the white underneath. We wouldn't, we won't usually peel it in, in the fall. We usually peel it. This is, I just wanted to show you how to do it. But this would be done, um, this, this would be last year's growth. This, of course, is New Year's, this year's growth. And if I want to use it for next year, I would wait, I would leave it on the bush all winter and I would pick it in the spring when the sap's rising. And so that was, that's how white willow is made. And of course, when you work with white willow, it's a very beautiful material to use and you have to use it when it's wet. So that's the story of the white willow basket and how lucky I was to find such a lovely one I could buy in Sault Ste. Marie. I'm sorry I don't know his name, but that also was in the 1980s. So I've been collecting my baskets for quite a long time. Now, the fourth basket we're showing comes from across the Atlantic, from the northern parts of Sweden, where the Sami people live. And the story is that I was very fortunate to go to Sweden in the late 80s to learn how to use birch bark and also birch root with somebody called Karen Lindholm, who was a wonderful teacher. Now, birch bark is very, very much used for everything in Sweden, but we don't very much hear about the birch roots. And the story of this is, comes from the Sami people who live up in the north, and they, of course, have reindeers. And in the spring, when the reindeers are out, they have lots of milk from the reindeer, and they make cheese. But they live in a land with very little trees, very little anything. And to make cheese, you need a basket that will separate the curds from the whey. In other words, something quite tight being woven that will let the liquid through. And they discovered that they could make a coiled basket with the birch roots, the trees that would grow on the edge of the, their land and they could coil it and make it into a little basket. So they would go out and collect the roots. The birch roots are very um, high. They can find them fairly easily in the ground. But another source was they had tremendous winds and they'd go and look for trees that got blown over and the roots were exposed and they could find them. Now, they would collect the roots. And when you collect a root, it's something that looks a little bit like this, a long thing thing that goes on for a long way, but of course it's brown and it has often little hairs on it. So when you collect your roots, you have to, to wet them if they've already dried and you, you, you put your knife on and you just scrape them back like this and you clean, you clean them. You take them and you have to clean them all the way down. And it's all, all preparation for natural materials is almost as much as making the basket because you have to repair it. See how nice and white it is underneath? We, we collected them in, in, I went out and did collect them in Sweden and these are some of the ones that are left. You can also find, if you're interested in working with roots, spruce trees have lovely roots too and they're fairly close to the ground. So we did this, we went and collected our roots and then we brought them back and we put them in a bowl of water like this to keep them wet. And then we spent probably a whole day making them ready, preparing them. And if you want to make them finer, you can actually cut them and split them and make them into two. So once that was done, we used the coiling technique. Now, because I was traveling, I didn't want to make anything big. So I made this little tiny basket, but it's very, very strong. It would almost run over it with a car and it's coiled, the coiling technique. And you can use, I use the wider roots for the core and the finer roots for the weavers. 
So I made this dear little basket, which of course you see is tiny. And then I also made a little medallion. And this would have been like the cheese baskets were made. They would have made them like this. And of course it would have been bigger and it would have come up on the side. But I think it's wonderful to think that they could find a material in their very sparse environment and make such a useful basket and actually be able to make cheese. Now our last basket in this exhibition comes from Japan and I had a wonderful visit there to an international conference of fibres back, I think it probably was in the, in the 80s, probably in late 80s. And after I'd been to the conference, I was extremely interested in the bamboo basketry work, the factory and how they made it. So first of all, I went down to Kyushu and I went to see the bamboo basket making school, which was very interesting. And then I went up and I went to stay with friends in Hokkaido, which is at the very north of Japan, to stay with a couple who had been in California and had become, she had become interested in baskets. And when I was staying there, they took me to a bamboo museum, which was a fascinating place because they had an idea that when the visitors came in, you would go to a hall, and there were mats all around the hall. You could sit on your mat, and then they, they would teach you how to make a basket. Now, I thought this was a wonderful way of introducing people to basketry with a very simple way of doing it, with a product at the end that they could use without spending three or four days getting ready. First of all, they would give you a little piece of wood like this with the holes in it. And then I would be given a fine piece of bamboo or quite a lot, but I didn't, of course, I can't use bamboo here. I use a fine round reed that I can buy from the basketry suppliers. And then you take the bamboo or the material and the stakes are very simply made. They come down in one hole across the bottom and up the next hole and the next one comes down across which means that every stake is double. It's come across and up and then there's another one which of course gives it a nice flat border at the bottom and it doesn't fall over and that the stakes are all double instead of just being little thin ones they're now two. So that's the first part to put in the two stakes and have two stakes. If you're making this you need an odd number of holes because otherwise when you go over and under you won't change your weave as you go around and so then it's just very very nice you just sit there over and under over and under you weave round and round and round and it's it's a lovely when you're a basket maker you really feel it's a lovely feel the, the putting the material behind in front and then you just push down I haven't this isn't wet so I can't do it very much just push them down but if you would like to make baskets you get the feel of weaving backwards and forwards you get the feel of the basket and you can bring it up and you can bring it up to however long you want to do it and then when you get to the top you would make it nice and wet and of course when you're making basketry material these all become very nice and wet when they're um, soft and pliable when they're wet and of course they, they they're much stiffer and could crack when they're dry and then at the top you just take them behind and front behind it would be quite an easy way to make a border and because they're double stakes it makes an interesting border at the top so you would go behind one in front of one behind one behind one in front of one behind one and poke them around and then you'd snip them off inside so I thought I'd show this is my idea for this little exhibition of making a basket very simply with a little basket that you could use afterwards. And the other thing I was going to show you was I did make a basket, and this is a traditional Japanese basket. And it's a very beautifully made traditional basket because it starts off on a square and it turns into a round, round basket. The cedar, and they use cedar in their basketry in Japan, comes in again and looks like it's got a cedar rim. It's very beautifully done and um, took me three days to make, as you can imagine. I'm sorry, I don't remember what this stuff was we used. It was something very fine and pliable. And of course, this makes it stand up nicely on its base because so often baskets, um, 
aren't, aren't stable. So this is a lovely little basket and it's very ornate. It's a very typical Japanese bamboo basket. A lot of work and very finely done. What a difference to the big willow baskets we make and the big other ones. But basketry is an incredible medium because it has so many different varieties of shapes, sizes and of course materials. I think the interesting thing about this exhibition is that all the baskets that I've chosen are made from materials that grow right there where they're made. And that's what's so wonderful about basketry. You can find materials, you can make baskets and um, they're on your doorstep. So I hope you've enjoyed this exhibition. If you have, the Basketry Museum is going to be publishing a little um, letter starting from September. So if you tune in to the Basketry Museum website, you will find it. It will be called the Basketry Threads and I'll be sending it out every week, probably on the weekend, with just little snippets about basketry, either making materials, technique, or just stories. 